So, Gert, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Corne. Well, first of all, thank you for the organizers to uh, invite me, and I'm honored to give the keynote for this morning. As you see, phenotyping wheat and banana. Um, I only worked for the last 10 years on banana. I worked for 30 years on wheat, so uh, it's good for you to have the balance a little bit. Uh, but let's kick it off. So the first slide is the Research Institute for Plant Protection. This was the building that was there when I entered the first time in Wageningen somewhere in the early 80s. And this was really the center of striprust phenotyping. Uh, not anymore, so that has been taken over by other labs, but striprust or yellow rust in wheat was a major pathogen and still is, and it's an increasing, increasingly important pathogen. And the phenotyping really was uh, manual. There was even no genotyping in the early 80s. That's what we have to keep in mind. So you, the left panel, you see the disease, uh, very destructive, kills the foliage, but the scoring that we did is, as you see in the right panel, each interaction was scored either between zero and nine. Nine super susceptible, zero, no symptoms. So that's how we scored thousands of plants manually, feed in the data manually, but this was the basis of genetics, of course, of gene identification, and eventually also of gene mapping and cloning. So I was thrilled by wheat as a crop. The origin of wheat, so the fertile crescent, as you can see over here, the region of uh, dissemination or distribution of Triticum monococcum, the A genome donor, Triticum dicocoides, very minor area here to Israel, the first uh, original uh, tetraploid, and then eventually Eglos carosa, the D genome donor, together build the ABD genome of wheat. And as I said, striper is very important with all manual scoring. And of course, always comparative phenotyping of seedlings and adult plants. And adult plants was either uh, in the field or in the greenhouse, but mostly in the field. But quite soon I switched to Zymus septoria tridicide. This is now the latest name. This is not going to change anymore. It, this disease is uh, called septoria tridicide leaf blotch. In the past we also called the fungus microsphalogram and nicola, but this is now all Zymus septoria tridicide. So as you can see, necrosis in the leaf and all the black spots that you see over there are asexual fruiting bodies or pycnidia. They release pores once the humidity is high, and these pores are splash dispersed. Meanwhile, the fungus also has a sexual cycle. So some of these black dots here are perithesia. They contain ascospores, and they are discharged, and they are airborne. And that's how the epidemiology of the disease works. So we were very fortunate to identify the sexual system in this fungus. So we cloned the metatype genes, did lots of genetics, and eventually made a linkage map generated a genome sequence and identified genes. So this is the symptom of the disease. And all my research in this fungus revolved around specificity or sex. So I will just touch upon very briefly. The specificity question is this one over here. So this was phenotyping. No digital phenotyping, literally scoring individual leaves, the percentage covered by pycnidia of each and every seedling leaf. Thousands of leaves. And eventually you build up these databases, and that's of course the basis for any genetics we did in the, pa in, in the past. And still very important, but if you can automate this, that would save us an awful lot of time. But this is hardcore manual phenotyping. Feed in all these data in Excel files and work from there. Uh, this is an ESCO spore that I just mentioned. So each ascus in a perithecium of this fungus contains eight spores. They are discharged, and here we slam them into water agar. So that's why we can visualize them on, uh, by scanning electron uh, microscopy. And eventually, these two systems uh, have resulted in a paper where we cloned the first avalence effector in this fungus. So, but we also looked at fungicide resistance. And for fungicide resistance, you look at these discharged ascospores, so you saw the previous image, but this is how you see it at light microscopy. So this is the system, this is a Petri plate, here's filter paper, and you put here seedling leaves that are really deteriorated, but they contain the sexual fruiting bodies. So once you, once you uh, take these filter papers out of water and you put these, let's say, the wet uh, leaf particles here, 
you have a sudden drop in humidity in the battery plate and that is discharging the ASCOS pores and they just slam to the agar. <clears throat> so to really understand the dynamics of strobilator resistance, we had to scan, I checked it last night, 25,000 ASCOS pores and their germination behavior. This was all manual. And so again, here comes in, if we can do phenotyping of these individual spores and automate it, that would be fantastic because it really increases our throughput and um, we are able to generate many more data. So, uh, as I said, we also mapped and cloned genes. So this is the last one that was cloned by a whole team and I was part of that team, STB16Q. So 25 years of research in this fungus, still a major pathogen in Europe, 350 to 700 million euro yield losses only in France, the biggest wheat producer. Uh, this is the cost, fungicides, 1.2 billion USD, that's the total market for Zymus septoria. And if you now go to France, to France and you talk to French wheat growers, despite the fact that we did for 25 or 30 years research by a community of about 100 scientists, the problem is still there. And so that's a little bit of a disappointing message. And so we really have to continue to integrate all these data sets. And I also put down this number here. So to eventually clone this gene, we had to phenotype close to 10,000 plants seedlings and adult plants. So it gives you a little bit of a scope how much phenotyping is involved to map and to clone genes. So, um, Simon Septoria research, eventually over time we collected close to 8,000 isolates. These isolates were all in Wageningen and now they are in the University of Kiel in Germany. Uh, and many of these isolates have been genotyped. And so there was a time that phenotyping was the only thing we could do because there was no genotyping. Then genotyping came in and phenotyping was considered to be, well, this kind of old-fashioned, right? Now we're in a genotyping age and fortunately later on we realized, mm -hmm, this is not the case. We need both. We need phenotyping and genotyping to move forward. So many of these isolates have been genotyped and phenotyped and they are now in another university for the community to take along in future research. So we switch gears and I show you here one of the first movies we generated and these are wheat spikelets and they are infected by Fusarium, Fusarium graminearum. So you see over time the disease is colon, the fungus is colonizing and is killing these spikelets, whereas these ones here, they are protected by a fungicide. This fungicide was developed by BioCropScience and the, the film was, this movie was made by Finovation, the starters of Finovation, Henk Jalink. And this was uh, 20 years ago. So we already started exploring how can we actually capture images of disease progress. And Bayer used this in their marketing campaign for this particular fungicide because this was really cool for them. Um, of course, the beauty was that we could, over time, quantify these signals so you really could see, hey, look, this is the progression of the disease, right? So we saw symptom uh, development. Eventually, what we did and that's what you see here, so it takes some time to see what image is coming up. But here we used a GFP-labeled Fusarium strain and inoculated wheat heads. So what you see appearing on the screen, just give it a few seconds. And we consider this really cool. This was also 20 years ago, but I think it's still cool. I hope you agree. So you see the image of the head appearing, but this is just due to the colonization of a labeled strain. So you don't visualize the head, you visualize fungal biomass. Uh, so this is, I would say, kind of a core cool phenotyping, and I'm very happy we have now the facilities in ANPAC that we can uh, do this at a much, higher, much uh, faster pace and intensity. So um, switching gears now to banana. So this is a perennial crop, entirely different story. And the banana, banana itself is an ecosystem. So you see here all the bugs, fungi, bacteria that are threatening each and every banana plant. So these plants, they produce a bunch every nine months. And many of the plantations, they have about, let's say, 2,000 uh, plants per hectare, more or less, varies a little bit in the region where you are. 
uh, but many of these plantations are there for at least 10 years. This is not an annual crop. Uh, only in India there is some uh, annual production, but in most of the countries it's really a perennial crop. Now, I will focus on these disease, this disease here, black cicatoka. That's a foliar pathogen. It is related to Zymoseptoria treatisei. They're both Dothelomyces, so they ha it has a very active sexual cycle. And I will also look at Fusarium fungi that infect uh, the roots and colonize the vascular system. The plants start wilting and eventually dies, and there is no yield. So let me just highlight a few aspects of international banana production. So beforehand, each and every banana that you eat, here, back home, in the supermarket, don't pay attention to the labels that is not differentiating these bananas. It's all one and the same thing. It's all Cavendish. 95% of the export trade is one variety, globally. 50% of global production is Cavendish. Very important also for domestic markets. Super susceptible to black cicatoka. So for each and every banana that we eat, on average, these plantations are sprayed with fungicides at least 50 times. So keep that in mind. Don't be scared. There's no fungicide residue on the fruit or in the fruit, but it's all on the foliage to protect the crop. Otherwise, you just cannot export. So this is the headline. This is the starter. Let's dive into this crop. Here you go. Black cicatoka. This is the symptom. Of course, banana are huge leaves, right? Every 10 days a new leaf, completely defoliated by the fungus. This helicopter plantation in Costa Rica comes back now 70 times per year. Due to the selection pressure of fungicides, this fungal population is increasingly insensitive. And of course, eventually we run out of fungicides, right? And so this is an immense problem. And breeding bananas is not easy, and they are not right now available. So this is a long time effort, and you can imagine that working on improving disease resistance, genetics, breeding, you need a lot of phenotyping and genotyping. So here's the banana I just told you about. Once you eat it, remember this. One third of the production cost is shear fungicides. Okay, so I'm pretty sure your next banana tastes different. So keep it in mind. Uh, and this is not big industry. The major production is done by thousands of smallholders around the world. And they all suffer from this particular disease. So this is then what phenotyping means uh, working with uh, black cicatoka, the disease caused by a fungus called Pseudocercospora figensis. So cicatoka is a complex, but the main driver of the disease is Pseudocercospora figensis. So this is actually right now ongoing in our greenhouses at Wageningen University. So here you see a diverse panel of banana accessions, different diploids. The bananas that we eat are triploids, so that's why they are seedless. But the wild bananas are diploids, so you can cross them, you can generate mapping populations and do genetics. So this is um, the, about the stage that we inoculate these plants, so they're about two months old. This is no comparison to Arabidopsis, right? One phenotyping assay of banana takes you at least, um, it's about uh, two months for the plants to be inoculated, then it takes another eight weeks before we can start scoring. So that's the pace we have in banana, right? So in banana, everything goes slow. Uh, and that's why many people are reluctant to uh, be engaged with this crop, because it's simply difficult. But it's not just the banana we eat. This is a super important staple food for millions of people around the world and particularly in, uh, in sub-Saharan countries. So this is about the stage, right, two months old. Here you see these holes, so that's why uh, we have sampled all these plants to do RNA-seq experiments. And then eventually, this is the symptom development that we have on each and every of those young leaves. So there is, you saw the picture of the um, Cicatoka symptom in the field. This is what we generate in the greenhouse, so very similar, lots of necrosis. Uh, but here we, these are not filled by the so-called pseudothesia that I mentioned because it's a heterothelic bipolar fungus, so it needs two mating types to, be, to have successful sexual reproduction. Here we inoculate with an individual isolate. And that's also something that is very important to mention. 
phenotyping in the field to a natural population doesn't make any sense for genetics because those, those fungal populations are highly segregating. So you just don't know what you're testing to, right? So you have to work with individual isolates. So that's what we can do in a greenhouse. You even cannot do it in the field. And so to eventually map genes, you have to work with individual isolates. That's also what we learned from the work in, from the work in wheat. Septoria, most breeders phenotyped in the field and tried to map genes. We only were able to successfully map genes once we started to work and to phenotype with individual isolates. You cannot do that in the field because that's immediately contaminated by the natural populations that are extremely diverse because of the ongoing sexual cycle. And so these, these, these type of assays are crucial to make progress. They're crucial to identify genes and of course to have markers that we can use in breeding. So the way, while we, the way we process these, um, these phenotypes is now by a system that has been developed by Keygene. Uh, so the details are not important, but here you see the infected leaf. So we capture the image. We have the green area and the infected areas. That's all being quantified. And in that way, we build up databases with quantitative data for gene mapping and identification. So here you have an example of where we infiltrate a banana leaf with juglone, that is one of the uh, uh, metabolites produced by Susicospora fegensis that plays a role in pathogenesis. So here you see the controls. We just did this this week. So 30 minutes after infiltration, you already can see by imaging, you can see the, uh, the effect of juglone, and this is, eight, this is eight hours. So it's very rapid. Uh, so we can, you know, detach these leaves and process them for image analysis. So I, I put in this slide just to make sure that we are with our, both our feet on the ground. So this is a report from the OECD, 2022, just came out. And here you see what is the disasters that threaten food production. And as you can see, crop pests and animal diseases is only 9% of this pie chart here. So the major threats is drought, floods, and storms. That's why I put this here. So later this morning, I have a meeting with officials from the Pakistani government. Because of the floods, 30% of the country is flooded, and particularly this area, this is the Sindh province. This is the basket for banana production in Pakistan. Very important for national consumption. Pakistan is not an exporter. This is all domestic markets. All these banana areas are totally flooded by water. But on top of that, this is also the area that is struck by Panama disease. Panama disease caused by Fusarium fungi, and the killer strain is a strain that's called Tropical Race 4. Cavendish bananas, super susceptible. They were once the solution. If you go back 100 years, Cavendish saved the industry because it was and is still super resistant to the strains that caused an epidemic 100 years ago. So they solved the problem, they saved the industry, millions of growers and people involved in the industry. Tropical Race 4 is a strain that originates from Indonesia and now is disseminating around the world and absolutely killing Cavendish bananas. So here everything comes together. Floods, Tropical Race 4, that's also spread by floods. So you can imagine there is intense havoc in this area. So let's keep it in mind. We work on uh, pests and pathogens, and of course, very important, but this is really what is coming towards us now and in the future. So abiotic stress and the combination with biotic stress, that's where, that's where we are heading for. Now, Panama disease is what you see over here. So on the left, that's the symptom of the disease. So as I said, severe wilting, the leaves become glorotic, eventually die. If you cut the stem over here, this is what you see. So this is totally colonized and occluded by fusarium uh, biomass, but as a response of the plant, there is also uh, galls being produced that really occlude the vascular system, and that's why wilting occurs. And in this process, the fungus produces an enormous amount of spores, including resting spores that are in the soil. So once you have this disease, you just cannot come back the coming 20 years. That's in a nutshell the story. 
unless you have resistant varieties. That's what I said. Cavendish saved the industry because it's super resistant to the strains that caused the previous epidemic. So that also shows the power of resistance. If you have resistance, no problem. The soil is totally contaminated, but you can grow this variety. So that's what we need to develop now for not a new Cavendish, because we have to get rid of this monoculture. That's the cause of the problem. Having 90% of one variety, 10,000 of hectares, that is just from, for an agronomist, insane. It's extremely risky. So we have to diversify. And that's why we need to have this type of resistance. So here, uh, this is another level of uh, mapping and phenotyping. So going from the cell level or the plant part level, uh, we really have also to consider that we should be ready to map entire areas. I'm not talking about an individual field. We can map an entire field with a drone, but you cannot map a region with a drone. So what we're doing here, and that's in Peru, and this particular area here, that's called Pura. Now, Tropical Race 4 has arrived here in Colombia, and Tropical Race 4 has arrived here in Pura. Remarkable, because this area, as you can see, this is green, but that's because it's all irrigated from this one and only lake over here. All the rest is desert, super dry. So that's why they don't have black sea catoca, it's too dry. So many of the organic bananas that come to market come either from Peru, because you don't have to spray with fungicides, or the Dominican Republic. And yet, Tropical Race 4 arrives here. There is no natural way for Tropical Race 4 here to arrive. Because it's a soil morph fungus, it travels slow. If it travels, it's by contaminated tools, contaminated soil, and of course by people. So once we start traveling nationally, internationally, intercontinentally, that's how we drag the fungus along. So that happened here in Colombia, and it happened here in Pura. So, as I said, this region is populated with banana plantations, 8,000 growers, not organized. And then Tropical Race 4 in the area that is disseminated by water. So that's why we started with a company, Opus Insight, to map, aerial map the entire region. Look at each and every farm from the air to identify what are risk zones, what are flooding areas, where are the roads going? What is the logistic change in these areas to kind of trace the future dissemination of Tropical Race 4 so that we can act proactively? So uh, NPAC, mapping, monitoring, phenotyping at the lowest possible level, but bringing this also to this type of landscape uh, mapping and integrating all this, that is absolutely crucial for the future if you want to deal with this type of international and intercontinental epidemics. Actually, we should call it a pandemic. Let me give you just a helicopter ride to give you an impression on the impact of Tropical Race 4 or Panama disease. This is Mindanao, the most southern island in the Philippines, 80,000 hectares of banana, sheer Cavendish. The music is too frivolous, honestly. This is Panama disease. So all these spots here are taken out by Tropical Race 4. So this area has small growers and they sit next to this river here that is frequently flooding. This is how they try the smoke that you saw. That's how they try to sanitize and to, to clean the soil. It doesn't work, but nevertheless it's being practiced. Uh, but you see, this, this landscape here is dotted with small pockets and almost entire farms that are succumbing to Panama disease. Now, if you now, let's stay in this helicopter, we make now a right turn, and then we go to the industrial plantations. And we have worked in this area for over five years. Now here, this is at least 10,000 hectare farm. Again, I'm sorry to repeat this all the time, one variety. So, Sigatoka is as bad here as in Costa Rica. The helicopter that came 70 times by in the Philippines, it's now over 50. But this area is also struck by tropical race 4. 
So you can imagine how difficult it is for the industry. And as I said, let's underscore this banana is just, just not a fruit that we eat. It's super important for food security, for millions of people. So this is the current status. This paper came out last week. We were the first to map tropical rays for outside Southeast Asia. It originates, as I said, from India, from Indonesia, and then uh, jumped into Taiwan in the 60s, and from there it disseminated across Southeast Asia. And this entire area over here, they simply consider tropical rays for Asian problem. We'll never come here, no problem. Soilborne takes ages. We're fine. We're having Cavendish, right? So we published in 2014 that it was here in Jordan, 1,500 hectares plantation, right in the desert. How did it get there? As I said, right? Human traffic. Since 2013, it spread to 12 new countries in eight years. The last ones, Colombia and uh, Peru. And this paper is about the incursion of tropical race four in Mozambique in 2013. So we publish now that it's disseminating in Mozambique. So folks, this is not under control. It's not on that single farm. It's out there, that's outside that farm. There is no quarantine in that region, not outside that farm, there is no quarantine. There is no massive extension service that can inform growers. And this area here, there, banana is the staple for millions of people. In Uganda, on average, one kilogram of banana per person per year, per day. Right? So that's their staple, like wheat and maize and rice and other areas. So this entire area is threatened by disseminating tropical race four. That's not going to be there most likely next week, but eventually it will get there. That's what we know from history. If you look at the previous epidemic, those race one strains are all over the world. And as you can see, TR4 is on all major banana producing areas. So mapping, phenotyping, coming back to the theme of today, is incredibly important to make progress. And I have to underscore all this dissemination is humans. It's us, right? So it's sheer uh, neglecting the facts. I mean, there's still, and that's unfortunately an aspect of our time, there's still people here in Peru, they just think, three or four, that's conspiracy. It doesn't exist, no problem. You see, so that's, there is a whole social, social context that we have to take into account in these problems as well. So, in this research, we have collected many, many fusarium strains, and here you see actually a summary of the diversity of all these fusarium strains around the world. So what it tells you, the details are not so important, just believe me, what it tells you is that this is not a single, the race one strains are here, this is not a single strain, but this is multiple genetic lineages. We call them species, not everybody agrees yet, but I mean, this is genetically differentiation. But if you then look into TR4, this pie chart here is all TR4, and as you can see, this is absolutely the same. It's a single clone that is disseminating. And fusarium fungi are, as far as we know now, they have mating type genes, but they are asexual. Nobody ever found a sexual cycle of Fusarium oxysperum species. So in the past, this was called Fusarium oxysperum. And so this is the status. So many of these islets have been sequenced or genotyped, and of course, phenotyping is crucial to identify is a strain tropical race for, yes or no. So you have to go to a Cavendish plant, inoculate it in a greenhouse. Remember what I told you, it takes about three to four months before you know, yes, this is tropical race for by phenotyping it. We know it by genotyping in one day. That's not a problem. But you have to confirm and you have to show the community, yes, it is killing Cavendish. So you have to do inoculation assays, right? So, and these take time. So increasing death throughput by using technology is absolutely key. And this is how phenotyping for fusarium wilt looks like in a greenhouse. So again, these older plants, these are now close to three months old. You see all the yellowing, so there's all wilting as a response to inoculations with fusarium fungi. Um, and then the phenotyping, what do we score? And so, as I said, it's a fungal that goes into the root system, goes through the corm, and then occludes the vascular system. So by just scoring the leaves, that's far too indirect. That's only the response of uh, the occlusion of the vascular system. So we have to go to the underground corm and 
score that. So that's being done in this way. So just check and just imagine how much time it takes to score thousands of plants. So you cut the stem, so you go to the corm. We're almost there. There you go. You wash it. And this is the symptom of fusarium wilt in banana. So this is what we have to score, and this is what we have to grade. You can do it on a scale. We move away from scales. We don't like scales. We want quantitative data. That is way more reliable. So what we do is we take photographs, process all these photographs manually using ImageJ, so there is software, but automating this and stacking all these photographs and just send them through a pipeline, I hope that's also being facilitated by NPAC, because the whole data processing is incredibly important and it's extremely time consuming. But as you can see, we quantify the symptom development here in the quorum, so this is what eventually is the basis of any genetics we do. So it gives you an impression what phenotyping is about if you talk about banana and about banana diseases. So to finalize, um, now we're going to the microbiome part of banana cropping. So we had a mission into Indonesia to the center of origin. And what we did is we went into um, village neighborhoods, backyard gardens, connected forests, and looked at diversity, banana diversity, but also social diversity. And we also collected leaf samples with diseases, root samples, and also rhizosphere samples, soil. Right, so that was all done during a two-week expedition at two particular locations in Java, Indonesia. Now, looking at the microbiome, we collected rhizosphere, as I said, and we are interested a banana plant in a wild habitat. That's not a sterile individual. There's plenty of fungi, bacteria around it, but also in it. You know, this is a massive plant, right? You can even stand under it. As I said, this is quite different from Arabidopsis. You walk under your plants. You can even embrace them, right? So, <clears throat> plenty of microbes here in the vascular tissue of banana plants. So, what you see here is just an assay of a collection, we phenotype now about a thousand strains, bacterial strains, obtained from rhizosphere and endospheres of banana samples. And what we do is we just grow them and we check what effect do they have if we overlay this with tropical race 4. So are there individual bacterial strains that somehow suppress colony development? So we found hey, there are bacterial strains that actually promote the growth of TR4, so there is way more biomass produced here than, for instance, here that's being suppressed. So if you look at the total number, we phenotyped over 1,000 bacterial strains, 5% suppressors, 22 promoters of the colonization or colony development of uh, tropical race 4. So we also... Uh, genotype those strains, and interestingly, there is a whole bunch of bacillus strains, the details are not important, so two different species. And here you see this, this, this group here doesn't do too much, but this individual is interesting because it really suppresses up to the level of these strains over here. So this is very explorative, pretty recent data, but this is another level of phenotyping. That's actually why I show it. It's on a plate. So scan plates and, 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 and bring these data to life, right? So, in this talk, uh, I try to, to, to show you how phenotyping runs indeed from, you know, almost the cell level to entire areas, sometimes even entire countries. And having these data integrated with all the genotyping we do, that is, um, that's the way forward. So, I would like to thank my team at Wageningen University, everybody involved in this research. I would like to thank you for your attention. And I also would like to thank our sponsors of this work and thank you for the invitation.
thank you, Gert, for keeping so wonderfully in time. So that means that we have plenty of time for discussion, which is also nice to interact with uh, Gert about, uh, well, this very important uh, research. Uh, who can I give the word first? Questions for Gert? Yeah, okay. Maybe wait for the microphone. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the great lecture. Just a question about uh, open farms. When people grow, does it make any sense for you? Is, will it be useful for you as a phenotype or for the farmers to use satellite imagery for detection? Yes, yeah, sure. We, whenever satellite images are available, we use it. The disadvantage of satellite images, though, is we sometimes have just simply clouds, right? And, um, and with a plane, we fly at low altitude, and I mean, it is, of course, also high throughput. So whenever we cannot fly, we use satellite images. Uh, but the core, actually, of the mapping that we do from the air is using airplanes. I mean, at local scales, we can use drones. But I mean, the system is built in such a way that we can integrate all these data layers. Any other questions? Maybe, yeah, go ahead. Hi. Can I, uh, it's my turn, okay. Um, so there's one thing I don't understand very well. Uh, you mentioned that from the experience of uh, wheat, that um, you, if you want to clone the resistance gene, use one strain in a controlled environment, because outside there's many different strains there. Um, so if in this way you breed a variety that's resistant to this strain, does it mean it might didn't won't show any resistance when it's grown in the field? Mm -hmm. uh, and and then how, how do you deal with it? so yeah, many sure. strains? Yeah, thank you for your question. No, so I mean the, the basis is of course that we use. I mean phenotyping starts with really screening with many fungal strains. So you capture the diversity that is out there, right? So that's why I showed you the slide with that table with all these numbers. So that comes down to varieties and isolates. And so that in that case, it was 50 isolates on a whole panel of varieties. Uh, but eventually, you, by this phenotyping effort, you realize and you see that there are accessions that are just resistant to all these isolates that you have used. Right? And then once you, one, once you start then doing really genetic mapping, then you have to work with an individual, individual strain or multiple individual strains, so multiple separated uh, experiments. And of course, this is always accompanied by field screening. So this was work done in close collaboration with weed breeders, so they put the same material in the field. But what you simply have to keep in mind is, if you test in the field, you test to a black box. You just don't know what a black box contains. That black box is diverse. It's diverse for Zymus septoria, and it's diverse for Pseudocercospra the same story, because these fungi are super sexual. These are not clonal fungi. Fusarium is another story. That's a clone. Uh, but of course, as I said, I mean, the soil, there is not just fusarium. There's a whole microbiome out there, right? So if you want to really have the black and white image, scoring in the field also there is risky. And so the plea is actually. If you test in the field, that's fine. And of course, you need to look at your plant performance in the field. But you have to also collect data using those individual bioassays under controlled conditions. And for gene mapping and identification, these experiments are absolutely crucial, cannot be missed. Yeah, other question here in the front. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, in the end, you showed that you started to isolate the endophyte, endophytic bacteria from, from your samples from Java, but did you also go beyond this to, to, to check what, what is the global microbiome, so eventually also those which you may not be able to, to culture and, and eventually see some relation to, to the TR4 in, in infection or sensitivity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's of course the purpose. This is only the start. And uh, I mean, we are not on a quest to find, you know, a single strain that really can be used everywhere. We don't believe in that way of biocontrol. It's way more complex than that. So we try to understand what is actually the whole interactome around that particular fungus. So that's why we also look at the factors that are being produced by these fungi to create their own niche. Uh, but there are bacteria that somehow can survive. I mean, Fusarium is an intriguing fungus because, as I said, it's a killer in banana. 
but it can equally colonize other non-host plants without any symptoms. So it's kind of switching off its aggressiveness. It's in there, but it's not killing the plant. So why? Uh, is that due to the microbiome or the, endomy the, the endophytes in that non-host plant, yes or no? Those are all questions we don't know yet, but we are going to address them. So Roberto has a question here as well. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Great talk, Gert, as usual. Um, I go back to Subtoria, as mm -hmm. you know. Um, to what extent, and, and sorry, this might be a question too much on the genetic side. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how much of the quote unquote so said missing heritability we are missing for Septoria because if we can map it, it's n missing no longer. Um, to what extent, if you have any feeling in that direction, you think that the too much sex that Septoria is doing and that do the difficulties that we have in getting into both the genotype and the phenotype of the pathogen, this might be the cause of this quote unquote missing heritability that perhaps uh, the breeders cannot take advantage of. Yeah, now there is, there is still a lot to discover. That's, that's absolutely sure. Um, so the, the gene that I showed in the final um, infographic, that was STB16Q. That was now a gene, an absolutely unique gene that was, had resistance to all the strains that we used, more than 200 from around the world. So this was, you know, we really recommended the breeders, please don't use this individually because you put a lot of pressure on the gene, going to crack, right? Now, in this paper we showed, in, in, in this, in this um, cloning paper where I mentioned also the fungicides, we showed that Zymoseptoria has an absolutely unique feature. And we can summarize it, we can summarize it really with a one-liner. Using fungicides or using resistant varieties do control the disease, but you never ever can control sex. I just repeat, you can control the disease, you cannot control sex, period. So whatever you do, that fungus has always sex. So even an avirulence strain enters into a sexual cycle. So the avirulence genes are maintained in a population. Uh, so if you come from the rust or mildews, you think, okay, I have a resistant variety, clonal pathogen, you really kind of wipe out your population because it's simply avirulent and there's no sexual cycle, so it's away. Forget it. That's not the case with Zymo, right? So you, it's an entirely different system. So those avirulence effectors are maintained in the population all the time. And that's what breeders also have to realize. And that's also what we on, honestly only realized a couple of years ago by this, uh, by this uh, research. So yeah, uh, I don't have a direct answer to your question, but I mean, it's very clear that weed breeding for septoria resistance is challenging. Yeah, I, I think nobody has. Uh, again, another question, you're probably not the right person to ask. Hmm? Uh, to what extent, if any, do you think some uh, smart editing strategy might somehow uh, partially uh, be a remedy to what, what you just said? What type of strategy, sorry? Editing, edi editing strategy, yeah. gene editing on yeah, the yeah. pathogen side and not on the host side. Can you make a short answer? No, let's, yeah, let's keep it short. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yeah. Uh, let's give uh, Gert one more round of applause. <clears throat> <clears throat>